For thousands of untold generations, humanity has pondered our cosmic origins with a sense of awe and mystery, as though it were akin to pondering the nature of God. A finite amount of time ago, the universe began from a hot, dense, relatively uniform but rapidly expanding state and has evolved and cooled ever since. Today, 13.8 billion years after that event, humanity has been able to reconstruct our cosmic history, from those earliest moments to the present day, explaining the formation of elements, atoms, stars, galaxies, the cosmic web, rocky planets, and eventually, intelligent life as well. In many ways, it truly is the greatest story ever told. Not a biblical or philosophical or poetic account of all of creation, but a scientific one. And yet, when we see it depicted, visually, it often looks like a fluted glass, tipped on its side, that flares at one end and closes on the other. When it comes to the Big Bang, there are a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people view it as an explosion. A lot of people view it as having a particular point of origin in space. A lot of people conflate it with the notion of a singularity or the birth of space and time itself. All of these notions are incorrect. The Big Bang was not an explosion at all. Rather, the idea is rooted in the concept of expansion and the fact that space itself does not remain static, but is compelled to either expand or contract dependent on the matter and energy distributed throughout it. The universe expands, and that means that the distance between any two arbitrary points in space increases or lengthens over time, even if the objects within that space aren't moving relative to the space they inhabit at all. The Big Bang didn't occur at a particular place, but rather occurred at a particular time in our past. 13.8 billion years ago, to be precise. Where did the Big Bang occur? The answer to that question, at least as far as we can tell from within our observable universe, is everywhere, all at once. It's why, as we look farther away to objects found at great cosmic distances, we're seeing those objects as they were in the past, closer to the moment of the Big Bang. And the idea of a singularity is outdated. The Big Bang didn't begin from a singularity, but rather arose from a prior state where it wasn't matter and radiation that dominated the universe's energy content, but energy that was woven into the fabric of space itself. This corresponds to a period of cosmic inflation, which precedes, sets up, and, when it ends, gives rise to the Big Bang. It also makes tremendous amounts of sense to think of the observable universe as being a sphere that expands over time, especially in the context of the Big Bang. That's because the fastest speed that any signal can travel through the fabric of space is the speed of light, and that speed. It applies equally well to all observers at all times. When only a tiny amount of time has elapsed since the start of the hot Big Bang, the amount of the universe that a hypothetical observer can see is limited by the distance that a light signal could have propagated since that moment, since the hot Big Bang's onset. As more time elapses, light from greater distances away can now arrive, increasing the size of what astrophysicists call our cosmic horizon. By the time we reach the present day, our cosmic horizon is enormous. After 13.8 billion years, we can now observe signals up to a whopping 46 billion light years away in all directions. That's another thing that stumps many people. We can see farther away than the age of the universe multiplied by the speed of light. This, again, is because the universe has been expanding for all this time. And even though a light signal will only propagate a distance of 13.8 billion light years through space over the course of 13.8 billion years, the object that could have emitted that light at present will be found 46 billion light years away. There are multiple possible ways to illustrate our cosmic history. One of the deservedly more famous non-tube or non-cone or non-cylindrical diagrams that show it comes from Argentinian artist Pablo Carlos Budasi, whose representation of a logarithmic history of the universe shows the observable universe as a sphere, where, nearby, we're seeing objects as they are 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, like objects on Earth, in the solar system, and throughout the Milky Way where light that's traveled for billions of years is showing us objects as they were billions of years ago, revealing galaxies as they were in the cosmic past. 
Even farther away, we're seeing even younger, less evolved objects, even from the first one billion years of cosmic history. At these times, galaxies were less evolved, smaller, bluer, with fewer heavy elements and greater in number, as most of the cosmic mergers that will take place have not yet occurred. And at even greater distances, we can see events from the early universe, such as the first stars, the dark ages before any stars existed, the release of the background radiation left over from the Big Bang, an epoch before neutral atoms ever formed, an era before atomic nuclei or even protons and neutrons formed, etc. We can extrapolate this all the way back to the first moments of the hot Big Bang itself. Signatures that, if we could see them, would be found 46 billion light years away and 13.8 billion years ago. But this is not the most common depiction of the Big Bang, at least artistically. Instead, we normally represent it by a funnel-like shape, which isn't at all representative of how the universe, either the observable part that we can access or the unobservable part that lies beyond the limits of what we can see, is actually shaped. Although there are enormous variations on the theme, there are a few things that they all have in common. The biggest one, and one that's not necessarily intuitive to us, is that all of these depictions not only reduce the universe down to two dimensions, which you kind of have to do if you have only a flat, static image to use as your canvas, but that these aren't meant to show two dimensions of space at all. The universe, as we know and understand it, on the largest of cosmic scales, is filled with various types, or species, of energy. In particular, it contains dark energy, which today represents most of the energy in the universe, to the tune of about 68%. Dark matter, which is the second most abundant form of energy, making up about 27% of the universe, normal matter, made up of the familiar protons, neutrons, and electrons, which makes up about 4.9% of the energy in the universe. Neutrinos, which are ghostly particles produced in nuclear interactions, exotic particle decays, radioactive decays, and the early stages of the Big Bang, which have a tiny but non-zero mass and make up about 0.1% of the energy in the universe and photons, or particles of light, which are primarily produced in the Big Bang and also, secondarily, in stars, and make up only around 0.01% of the energy in the universe today. However, these different forms of energy had different levels of relative importance in the past. As a result, dark energy was initially very unimportant but with a constant energy density has become the dominant factor in the expanding universe only recently, over the past few billion years. Before that, matter dominated the scene for a long time, from about 9,000 years after the Big Bang until dark energy's takeover a few billion years ago. But in the very early stages, radiation, mostly in the form of photons, was the dominant species of energy, which is what put the hot in the hot Big Bang. Because the energy density of the universe and the rate at which the universe expands are directly linked, that means that the universe's expansion rate has changed, specifically has decreased, precipitously over time. Early on, the universe was expanding very rapidly and was dominated by high-energy radiation with large number densities of photons, each with very high energies. As the universe expanded, that radiation cooled off as it got stretched to longer and longer wavelengths. As the radiation cooled and the number density of particles diluted, the expansion rate dropped, all while progressively more and more distant light sources came into view. When the universe transitions from radiation domination to matter domination, the fact that the universe is cooling and that the radiation within it is being stretched to longer wavelengths and lower energies is no longer important. It's only the heavy, massive matter particles that play a major role, and so the energy density and the expansion rate drops as the volume of the universe increases. Finally, when dark energy takes over, the expansion rate ceases to drop and instead asymptotes to a constant value. First, the universe as we understand it didn't actually begin with the hot Big Bang, but rather a phase known as cosmic inflation preceded and set up the hot Big Bang. During inflation, the way that cosmic expansion worked was very similar to the way it works during dark energy domination. 
the energy density remains constant and the expansion rate doesn't decrease, causing the separation distance between any two points to increase exponentially as time goes on. Only, unlike today's dark energy-dominated phase, the expansion rate during inflation was tremendous. And second, once inflation ends and the hot Big Bang begins, the transition to a radiation-dominated phase is immediate, and this causes the universe to rapidly evolve in the way we're familiar with since the start of the hot Big Bang. Everything begins as a hot, dense, almost uniform primordial particle soup, and then, as the universe expands and cools, matter and antimatter annihilate away, protons and neutrons form, nuclear fusion creates the light elements, neutral atoms form, the earliest stars and galaxies form, and eventually, an intricate cosmic web, networking galaxies and the large-scale structure of the universe together, comes into existence. There are fundamental limitations to what we can show with only a two-dimensional canvas and a four-dimensional, three of space and one of time universe. The most common depiction sacrifices showing the sphere-like nature of our observable universe in order to more properly depict the evolution of time. However, this doesn't mean, and was never intended to mean, that the universe is shaped like a cone, tube, cylinder, or funnel. That shape appears because we are attempting to illustrate how the size or scale of the observable universe grows with time, as we evolve from the left end of the picture to the right, as time continues to pass. Thank you so much for coming this far with us. Remember to join us next time, in the next video. Until then, take care and good night.